believe we're ready to start now. And we'd like to welcome all of you who are watching this recording of our Welcoming Publications webinar put on by our project coordinator, Amy Gertz. And Amy, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right, thank you. Well, I have been working with Rural and Small Town Mission for about uh, six years now, since a late part of 2009. And a lot of my job involves publications and making sure that those uh, get those resources out to the different churches. And we want to make sure that they always find ways to make the information easily accessible and also that they make people feel like they understand how to get the information they need. So we want to really reach out to rural America for Christ and, and let them know what's happening in our small towns. But we always want to do it because we're sharing God's word, not just to see more people. It's about sharing God's word at all times. So I don't know about you, but when we walk into our churches, I pretty much expect to find a bulletin handy when I walk in the door. And that's good. Bulletins are a time-honored way to make announcements and guide us through the order of service. But congregations also use other things like newsletters and flyers. We have websites on with Facebook. We have changeable signage out front. And sometimes people go a little bit different directions and use t-shirts with their church logo on it. Um, and you can also use your email that go out of the church office. And maybe uh, the pastor has the opportunity to share information in that way. However, it can be really easy when we look at these same type of pub publications, particularly our weekly bulletin, and we forget to look at them with the visitor's eyes. We can overlook information that a newcomer or a visitor needs in order to know how to join us places. So with that idea in mind, let's talk about some ideas that you can use for all your publications and take those as opportunities to invite those who may not be in the know. So contact information, this is so important. One way to make sure that you are very consistent with your contact information is to consider establishing your own stationery. Um, have a header or a footer that includes all the congregation's main contact information, the address, the phone number, website, email, pastor's name, maybe the search secretary's name um, or the congregation president or maybe the organist. These are things that people maybe need to know very easily and quickly, and you don't want to forget to put it on your information that goes out of the office. <clears throat> you can also use the same information over and over again on your bulletin, on your newsletters, and that makes it very easy for newcomers to know how they get a hold of someone if they have a question or a concern. I also really recommend as a bonus tip that you have a similar automatic signature that goes out on your email. Um, some churches can put their congregation mission statement in that. Maybe you want a Bible verse, but you really want to make sure that it has phone numbers. It has a mailing address. Maybe you have a Facebook page. Maybe you have a website. Put all of that in that signature so it automatically goes out every time you reply to somebody. And that way, they can get a hold of you in a multiple ways if they have questions. Never assume that your readers just know. This means that absolutely everything that's publicized should have all those who, what, where's, and when that we learned about when we were in grade school. So when our church picnic has been held in the town park for the last 50 years on the 4th of July, we sometimes think, Everybody knows that it's at the park on the 4th of July at noon, but you know what? Not everybody does know. And in addition to making sure that they know that, we want them to feel invited. So be sure to list all those details out and make sure that your publicity gives plenty of notice. We like to give events in our office six to eight weeks of publicity time as a minimum. That way, repetition can also be a good way to let people know things because people have a tendency to miss things the first and sometimes the second time that they go in front of them. So keep repeating. But here's some examples of why you can't assume things and sometimes why we just don't see it in our own bulletins. I took these examples out of some church bulletins when I was visiting different places. P 
can't overstate this. Here in the first example, Women's Guild meets today after worship. Well, the Women's Guild knows and understands what this means. But if somebody new is interested in the Women's Guild, they don't know where or who to contact if they would like to join for the first time. So you need a little more information there. The second example, next week, July 21st, will be our congregational picnic. Meat and drinks will be provided. Please bring a side or two. And if you're going, please sign up so we know how much food to buy. All right. There's not enough information here again. There's no where, no time, no contact, no info on where to sign up. It was great that they put the day, and it's great that they invited people and told them what to bring, but they didn't tell them how they were supposed to sign up. Where is that sign-up sheet at? Who do they contact if they have questions? Those are really important things for outsiders, newcomers, visitors, if they would like to join you. And that's the goal of these kind of things. We want to use them as outreach. They're great as family events for the people who know and live there all the time. But we also want to widen our family circle, invite more people in as our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, bulletins are great. But let's go beyond the bulletins. Only the people who are actually in church are going to see the bulletins. And let's face it, some people are not very good about reading the bulletins in the first place. So use multiple forms of media to get your message out. And you're going to reach a whole new crowd. And you have lots of opportunities. There's flyers, church signs, text messages, Facebook. That is a great way to get a hold of the younger crowd. You can use old fashioned methods like a float in the, the town parade, t shirts. This is a picture of me at an event our church did, and I'm wearing a neon colored t shirt. It is so bright that my chin is turning yellow from the color, but everybody sees it and knows. Who we're at, who we are, because the church information is on the t-shirt in multiple places. So make sure that if you have anything out there from your church, you follow those four W's, who, what, where, when. Get that information in their hands and just invite. You might come up with some other ideas about how you can go beyond your bulletin. But again, invite and follow those four W's. Now, some of you might be asking by now, how can we do some of these things? Well, I'd like to provide you with a few additional tools you may not have considered for getting your message out with publicity. We have Microsoft Office is always a great tool. So many of our computers come with it or at least access to it. Don't feel like you need to reinvent the wheel. You can just keep using what you have, but look it over with some fresh eyes. Does it answer all those questions that a visitor might have or a newcomer might have? And if you aren't sure that you might see a mistake that somebody from outside might see, give it to somebody else who doesn't belong to your congregation and let them proofread it for you, just like you might have done when you were in school and had somebody proofread a paper for you. It's always helpful to have somebody look at stuff for you because they see things that you can't. Now, there's lots of free templates out there for you that you can find on the internet that make many kinds of different publications for your newsletters, your brochures, your flyers. Um, like I said, Microsoft Office is a great tool, but there's also some tools like Prezi that you can find at Prezi.com, which is great for doing power, a similar thing to a PowerPoint, but you don't have to pay for it because it's completely free. And it also actually has some neat features that uh, PowerPoint does not have. And it has a great tutorial. So if you don't feel very savvy with these types of things, it'll walk you through it step by step and help you along. Um, maybe you need to find a way to hold a meeting with people. What we're using today with the webinar, this is a free service as well, anymeeting.com. And you can um, hold virtual meetings. And that might work well for you if you have people kind of scattered around or you need to access a time frame that didn't seem quite as normal. Um, so anyway, there's lots of possibilities out there that with just a little bit of searching you can use. And again, they almost always come with tutorials and user guides that can help walk you through it so you don't have to feel like you
you need to be an expert before you try anything for the first time. Newsletters are still a great tool for communicating and they can always get across more than your bulletin can. I suggest that you pick a template and let it work for you month after month. Um, you might consider using an electronic format and then either only print it quarterly or maybe don't print it at all anymore, depending on what your congregation finds works for them. And this is gonna save you a lot in time as well as in printing costs. Use your newsletter to kind of forecast those distant events that are farther off in the future. You can remind your people again. Remember, they do better if they have reminders about what's coming up in the future. And don't feel like you have to do it all by yourself. There are lots of places you can get contributions from. You can get contributions from your district newsletters. You can contact places like the Lutheran Witness. You can contact um, RSTM and get reprints of useful articles that you might want to share with your congregation. There's always lots of resources out there. Now, websites. You really need a website in today's present, uh, in today's world. That web presence is so important. It's, it's a big deal because this is the first place that most people go to look when they move into an area. They do their shopping online. They do it online for their houses. They do it online for their schools. They do it online for their church. So you want to have that web presence so that they can use the web as their tour guide. And if you haven't done so already, you want to start by creating a URL, a digital address, that's really short and easy to remember and associates with your congregations, such as, like I have an example up here, um, your church name and your city, stpaulsanytown.org. And then you want to put that on absolutely everything. It's on your, pub on your publicity. It's better to drop the www.com and just list it the way I show you there. This makes it really easy for people to remember. Okay, so maybe you're saying right now, we don't have a website and this is kind of panicking you. Don't worry. There are lots of resources available for helping you get started. Particularly, I've listed a couple additional helps down in the corner, Concordia Technology Solutions and Concordia Theological Seminary in particular are a great place to start. Um, but they are not the only ones out there. When my husband and I had our own small business, we used a very inexpensive company called aplus.net for our small business. And it, again, had a very easy to follow user guide that walked you through step by step. So don't feel intimidated by these things. There are lots of resources to help you get started. Now, once you have that site built, you wanna get it on all your publicity and you wanna ask your members to share their, your site as well. Your members need to be aware of your site. If they don't know it, that isn't very useful again. So, and then you wanna ask their feedback because they know your church and if they can't find their way around it and they don't understand it, it's going to be very difficult for a visitor to do so. So if they give you some feedback, that it's not easy to find the way around or it doesn't tell them the things they need to know, take that into account and maybe make some changes early on. But again, when you get that publicity on things, and I do mean everything, it should be on your bulletin, your outdoor sign, it ought to be on the flyers you put out, it should be on your t-shirts, in your email signature, it should be on your Facebook page, everything. Then you wanna keep it simple to use, Things, to, other things to remember, you want to minimize clicks so that visitors don't have to be clicking around through a whole bunch of pages to get to stuff that they need to find. You want to keep your pages short and to the point. You want to think about it like an, an old fashioned newspaper. The headlines, the important stuff is always above the fold. So when you are folding a newspaper, you see it above the fold. And that's what you want to do with your website. All that important information is at the top of the page. Um, but then another thing to remember is don't try to cram in too much. Keep it clean and simple and uncluttered. So you ask yourself before you put something on the page, does this distract from our main point of this page? And then if it does, don't add it. Another thing to keep in mind is limit the hover states, particularly if you think your main crowd of people um, are gonna be older, because if anyone 
who uses a mouse kind of has trouble keeping that mouse steady, a hover state can be a really frustrating thing. So what you want to do is you want navigation menus that drop down, but they support hovering and then clicking. So they stay in place when you hover over them. They don't disappear. You've probably been on a website where you slide over something and you think you've got it there. And then as soon as you wiggle your mouse just a tiny bit, the, the hover, the drop down disappears. That can be really frustrating. You want your homepage to really create a strong first impression of your church. And one of the things that's important to have is an I knew part of the page. Things that you can include there are short videos that can, uh, welcome them to your church. You want to use a second person voice in these that say, we would love to have you visit us. And you want to make sure to list out basics like your worship time, your address, and you want to keep all those dates current. And it's a good idea to go for non-seasonal pictures. If you have up pictures of Easter and it's Christmas time, it's going to look like your website is not kept up to date. So you also want to be, again, clear and concise, have a statement of beliefs, have your frequently asked questions section, and have easy directions for the visitors. And by directions, I mean, how do they get around your your church? How do they get around your parking lot? You want to make them comfortable by addressing those things that they could be concerned about. Do they understand how long the service times are? How do they dress? Is there a traditional service? Is it more contemporary? Do the men wear suits and ties? Are jeans more normal? Is there a cry room, a nursery? Is there handicapped accessible bathrooms? These are things that sometimes people who come from different areas might expect or they wouldn't ask about. But if we have maybe a smaller rural church that only has a bathroom in the basement, that may be an issue we need to discuss with our visitors so they're aware when they come in. Uh, it's a good idea to have parking laid out. Sometimes we have parking lots in the backs of our churches that it's pretty obvious to us when we've gone to church there all the time. But it's not so obvious to a visitor that they need to park in the back and then walk around the front of the church, or maybe there is a back entrance. These are things that if we let visitors know, it makes them feel more at home. People can be very afraid of doing the wrong thing. And I'm going to put wrong in quotes. And drawing unwanted attention to themselves. They don't want to walk in the wrong door. They don't want to. Um, sit in the wrong section. So we want to consider how we might make them feel at ease and welcome. Last of all, you really want to introduce your pastor, include some of his sermons. He should have a really short but well-written biography that includes where he studied, any previous congregations he served, just enough personal, inv I'm sorry, personal information, but you also want to be sure to respect his and his family's privacy. Um, choose a picture that represents him and your congregation. Does he wear his collar? Does he wear a tie? Does he wear a slightly more casual, or do you choose a more casual picture of him in action, maybe? So think about how do you do that? What what represents your congregation? The, the sermons are important because they let people get to know your pastor's preaching and teaching style. And also, they are a great bonus for your shut-ins. Your shut-ins are going to take advantage of those sermons all the time. And you can also include a welcoming letter of introduction from the pastor. And it's a good idea to change this frequently so that he can highlight any upcoming opportunities for fellowship, such as Vacation Bible School, or maybe the Easter breakfast. You can think of different opportunities your church has. Um, in addition here, always welcome a, use a very clear welcome to both your worship and bible study in addition to the pastor's welcome because you want to you want to invite them to join you for worship you want to have your joy and excitement about having them come to join you there um, bible study is a great time for fellowship but if you don't tell them when Bible study is and don't invite them to join you, they may miss out on it. You want them to understand again how to feel welcome. Do they need to bring their own Bible? Do 
they need to have a, a special booklet to join in? Um, is there, you know, is there a resource they need to purchase? And don't forget to invite and announce at worship as well. So this is a good time to invite them to join you. And you can also include on your website a signups for service projects. Sometimes this is a great side door invitation for people who uh, maybe are a little less prepared to come to worship and Bible study, but is a great side door invitation for them to join and become involved with the congregation and for you to build a relationship and then invite them to worship later. <clears throat> um, important, your website is a living thing. You cannot just let it sit there. You've got to keep the info current and you should keep track of your effectiveness. There's a great tool for that. It's called google.com slash analytics, and it will help you track things. Some key things to track, uh, number of new website visitors versus the returning visitors, traffic sources, such as did your visitor find you through Google? Um, how much time did they spend on your page? And bounce rate, that means how many of them left right away? And then when's your highest traffic times? So now, while the website could have its full, full own topic, so could using a Facebook page. Um, while, face, while your website's a little bit more static, Facebook is a great place to be more interactive and, and really kind of visit with people. Social media was meant to build and maintain relationships. And so it has the benefit of being there 24 seven, so to speak. A lot of young people are gonna tell you that the first thing that they do in the morning when they wake up is reach over, grab their phone and check their social media feed. So you need to be intentional about your Facebook page if you're gonna have one. And I would say if you have to choose between a Facebook page and a website, choose the Facebook page. Um, if you have to have one or the other, really, I think you need both. But if you have to choose one or the other, Facebook's the way to go. But you can't, again, you can't just let it sit there. You have to have an intentional schedule. Um, you need to share events, prayers, and news, but you should always be respectful. The goal of your Facebook page is to develop those relationships, continue a discussion, and that allows you to share the gospel then in a very personal and inspirational way with the bonus of keeping your Facebook friends posted on what's happening in your congregation. And here's the, here's the big bonus of Facebook. Your circle is so big, but your circle touches my circle, which touches my friend's circle, which touches their friend's circle. And so it goes on and on and on. And so it, allow, it allows those relationships to expand in a much bigger way than we can ever do on our own. I recommend that you post one to two times a day. If you post too little, you're going to lose people's interest. But if you post too much, you're going to bore them. Here's some do's and don'ts. And they pretty much are opposite of each other. Do. You want to listen. You want to be respectful. You want to post something that's substantial. You want to work to expand your circle. You want to share those events, news, and prayers. But you do not want to be in your face. You do not want to be rude. You don't want to post stuff that's trivial. You do not want to use your Facebook page to circle the wagons and keep other people out or alienate. You do not want to share too much information or too much that's routine or nor do you want to be sarcastic in such a way that people reading over the internet are going to misread your information and take it the wrong direction. Okay, okay. before you post, be sure to craft your message and concentrate on
So sorry. We'll have things right back up here in a moment as we're getting Amy back on. Here we go. And Amy was talking about Facebook and social media. And we'll get her logged back on here just in a second. And then we'll get rolling again. I don't know what happened, but kicked us both off. So we'll see what happens here. And Amy's coming back online. And we'll get her going here in just a second. Can't have any technology event without a little glitch. Here she is. Amy, take it back over. Okay. Sorry about that. I was just saying that um, we need to be careful about our initials in particular because we at the LCMS have a tendency to use too many of those. So um, work those relationships. Make sure you have permission to share. Um, encourage your congregation members to like your Facebook page. For instance, down there I've got like us on Facebook. We always like people to like our Facebook page with LCMS at RSTM. So you see the link down there at the bottom. You can create similar one to that for yourself. And again, like your website, put that on everything so people know who you are. Um, you can, when people like you, your posting show in their feed. And again, that that circling of my circle touches your circle touches their circle, that allows what you've posted that shows in their feed. If they comment on it, like on it, it's going to show up in their friends' feeds more than likely. So it allows that information to expand. So again, I just touched on Facebook here. This could be its whole own webinar. As a matter of fact, we do have a webinar archived on social media, which I highly recommend you go watch if you're interested in doing more with social media. Um, and you can also do other social media like Twitter, uh, Instagram, et cetera. I do recommend that you find one that works for you and stick to it. For Rural and Small Town Mission, we have found that most of our constituents use Facebook. So that's what we work with. Um, again, that social media webinar is great and is very helpful. So in conclusion, don't forget that a lot of what we already do can be tweaked for outreach simply by looking at our publications with our visitors' eyes. How do we make people feel welcome and included? Um, be sure to have good updated signage on your property. It needs to have the proper worship times. Does it have the proper pastor's name on it? Don't have old signage. That is really, really a way of making your church look out of date and not welcoming to the people who are trying to visit you. Um, it cannot be overstated to include those dates, times, and places. This means on your signs, in your bulletins, any place else that people might find information, such as your flyers, your t-shirts, your website, Facebook. But the important thing is, remember that we are making people feel welcome because we are reaching out for Christ. And last of all is a slide with the contact information for Rural and Small Town Mission, because if I did not include that for you here, I would have done a very bad job indeed of telling you about welcoming publications. <laughs> so um, thank you for watching this today. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact us at Rural and Small Town Mission. There is my information and I'm happy to answer anything I can. Well, thank you, Amy. That was that was great. There's there's so much going on. It, it, it might seem a little bit overwhelming. So a little reminder, Amy said this earlier, bite this off in little chunks. It's not like you've got to go out and revamp everything tomorrow. But, but one thing I often hear, oh, we're just going to, if we give them all this information, we're going to be pestering them. People are going to feel like we're bothering them. Amy, is it possible to give anybody too much information? I would say it probably is possible, but it's highly unlikely. <laughs> Most of the time, um, people, especially if you're using multiple outlets to give information, some people are bulletin readers. Other people are newsletter readers. Some people go to Facebook. 
some, some people, people go to the website. website. So, so if you're using all, all of those methods, methods or maybe some people only look at their phone for text messages. So, so if you use all of those outlets, you're, you're only hitting certain people each time. time. Now, now, you may, you may have, have a very small percentage who read them all, do them, them all, and, and they've, they're, they're going to be like, oh my gosh, gosh I've heard about that event 800, 800 times. times. Well, well, you know what? what? Great. Have, Have you told, told 800 people to? <laughs> that's what we want them to do. And you remind them that's what you're asking them to do as a member of the church. You want them to share the information, too. Excellent. Yeah, I don't see any scenario where people can get too much information. I, I know just in the past in ministry... I have, we have given things in all those avenues that you said, and people still said, well, I didn't know about it. So uh, we just got to keep going. Uh, another, another thought I had uh, while you were presenting is uh, you had mentioned the use of, of Microsoft Office and some, some things in that suite. Uh, are there ways that folks that maybe don't have it in their budget to have Microsoft or have older computers? Is there a way that they can access some tools maybe online that, that might be helpful and, and less expensive? There are a lot of online options that are free. Um, there's Gmail, which is a free option and does most of the things that say Microsoft Outlook does. It, it may not be quite as flexible, but it's going to give you many, many of the same options. Um, for instance, instead of Microsoft PowerPoint, you can use the Prezi.com option and it's a free one. Um, Google, Google Docs, Docs allows, allows you to do a lot of what Microsoft Office uh, Word does. does. So, so you can, can if you go online, you can usually find an option that works for you by doing a search in Google or Bing or whatever search engine you like. You can usually find the option you want, even if you have to type in, say, Microsoft Office free options, <laughs> and you can find something that's similar. And again, just go in and Play with a little bit, see if you understand it, and if you don't, follow the tutorial. And if you're still not happy with it, look for one that you think you're comfortable with. For the first time, I used Microsoft Prez, or I'm sorry, Prezi.com, which is a free option of the PowerPoints. I did not know how to use it, but I just followed the tutorial and I let it teach me how. So. I actually wanted to do this uh, presentation in Prezi so that I could show you another option, but uh, any me doesn't work with it. So sometime if I have the opportunity, I would like to present this in a Prezi option so that you can just have the chance to see it. Very good. And, and just for the record, Amy and I both got on Prezi. She can use Prezi, me not so much, but uh, you know, it's all about making folks feel welcome and getting them the information that they need and and that's really the most important part uh, and maybe another option for folks to get some help would be that uh they contact our office exactly i would say if you feel like you are looking for some specific resource whatever it may be maybe you want to um do radio ads I have actually had different congregations call me and say we wanted to do a radio ad for our fish dinner uh, and I had I had to say at the time, well, I don't have any of those, but when you're done, would you please give me a copy so that I can use it as a resource for the next congregation who's trying to do that? And I do that all the time. I collect copies of things that people do and try to keep that as a resource for the next person. So if you need an article, if you need a, maybe you're looking for a good flyer for your church to use for an event, please just contact me. And if I have a resource, I will try to send it your way or give you somebody to talk to who's done something similar so if they can help you, they will. Oh, that sounds great. And if you just need a discerning eye to look at maybe something you're trying to do with a publication, shoot it to Amy, have her take a look at it. We'd be glad to help you out. Yeah. And I will tell you that one of the things to think about is it's not, it's not necessarily doing anything different. It's just thinking about if, if I look at this and I was a person who didn't belong to our church, would I feel welcome? You know, we have a, our church has an ease of breakfast every year. Have we done anything to make sure that the town feels welcome? So what do we do to put that information out there to invite people in the con in the community as well? Because if they join us for things where we can build relationships with them, 
they have an opportunity to hear the word and we have an opportunity to build a relationship with them and bring them into our congregation. So, you know, maybe it's the first year we put a newspaper article about the Easter breakfast and say, all are welcome. Maybe we run a newspaper or a radio ad. Maybe we put it on our Facebook page and again, say all are welcome with all the details. And my friends hear about it who aren't necessarily members of the church and their friends hear about it. And again, we're just spreading that information a little bit each, each time. Sounds good. Well, Amy, thank you for uh, some great information today on welcoming publications and, and using social media and all sorts of things. And God's blessings to all of you as you go out and, and do these things, uh, trying to connect people uh, to the word uh, so that they might know the good news of Jesus Christ like you do. Uh, God's blessings to you all. Thanks for joining us.